Hello and welcome to the spring edition of Kerno Sound. Here in Cornwall, the daffodils have been blooming on the cliffs of the far west and in the huge bulb fields inland, and lorry loads of Cornish springtime have been making their way around the world. The spring had come, the flowers in bloom, the birds sang out their lay. Down by a little running stream, I first met Maggie May, my little witching Maggie, singing all the day. Oh, how I loved her, none can tell, my little. Her hair was gold, her eyes were blue, and shining like the day. Her heart was ever pure and true, my little Maggie May, my little. Maggie singing all the day. Oh, how I loved her, none can tell, my little Maggie May. And all her voice was sweet and low. Twas like an angel's lay. I hear it now, where'er I go, the voice of Maggie May. My little witching Maggie, singing. My little Maggie May Oh, how I loved her None can tell My little Maggie May Maggie May must be one of the great all-time favourite Cornish songs heard all around the world since first being recorded at St Mabin in 1870. Our recording was a new one from the superb Cornish voices of Jinx Stack, and it came from our friend Bob Brimley at Brio Records down at St Just. But just because a lot of our music was first written down around 50 to 100 years ago doesn't mean that we're only stuck in the past. The traditional music of Cornwall is still evolving, as was proved by this year's Racker Day, when over 50 musicians met in Bodmin to compare notes and swap tunes. And the vitality and life of the music became obvious when we all tried to play the Trega Joran Furry.
Mike O'Connor is a musician who's made a special study of Cornish music. As we competed with the steaming tea urn in the only quiet room we could find, he tried to explain what it is that makes our music so special. Well, some people come to me looking for some individual unique characteristic that identifies Cornish music. And if they're going to do that, I'm afraid they're going to be disappointed because what we've got in Cornwall is a unique mixture. What we've got here, unsurprisingly really, is a combination of musical characteristics that come from the English tradition and a slightly smaller proportion that unsurprisingly comes from the Breton tradition. It just so happens that right now in Cornwall a lot of people are enjoying playing Irish music and there's nothing the matter with that, Irish music is jolly good. But there is a large body of people that is also enjoying Cornish music and they are embracing the tunes, whatever their origin, whether they came from the English dance tradition, whether perhaps they had their origins in Brittany, or some other medieval traditions that are even older than that. And I wouldn't say that people play them indiscriminately, but they don't discriminate against any of these items of music. They enjoy them all and they put them all together into a package that is together Cornish music. Back in the main hall, 50 assorted musicians were about to start learning the Tregor Joran Furry from Ron Kerno. We'll join them for the teach-in with the hope that this new tune will be played all around the Cornish world. But first, Ron told me how the tune came about. Well, basically, we all live, or most of us live in and around this village called Tregor Joran. And one day last year, a friend of mine in the village, and she thought it'd be a nice idea to have a, a, a village show, you know. And then Hilary Coleman, she thought it'd be a nice idea to have some music at the show preferably with musicians from in and around the village. Well, I was very surprised to see all these people from the village come out with, you know, with their instruments. And then Hilary and Neil Davey, between them, they wrote another tune, especially for the show, and they created a dance to go with it, um, which they then called the Tregajor and Furry. And after that, we, well, we just stuck together and every sort of, every once a fortnight, really, um, a little bit oftener than that, we, we get together and we have a practice and we meet at the Countryman and have a bit of a session up there and it's and that's how we stay together and that's about the story so far. <laughs>
debuted this past month, they've been celebrating. They've won hundreds of thousands of pounds of funding to build a memorial to Sir Goldsworthy Gurney. He was a Cornish-born inventor who created the limelight, famous for lighting the Houses of Parliament and even more famous for powering the spotlights which picked out the stars of the stage. And even when I worked in London theatres back in the 1970s, the follow spots were still called the limes. But the memorial's to be a cone of coloured concrete, filled with thousands of sparkling fibre-optic lights. It's controversial, and I spoke to Sue Richardson of North Cornwall Arts and architect Neil Tibbetts to find out more. We're not aiming to desecrate a, a space, we're aiming to improve on what is there, but in a contemporary way, in a qualitative way, and a way that hopefully all generations will, will approve it in now and, and uh, even more so in the future. I was brought in to raise funds from the Arts Lottery for the production, design and um, installation of the cone, which, as you probably know, is a celebration of the work of Sir Goldsworthy Gurney. And he was an innovator of the 19th century. I think he would be horrified if we did a replica. Um, and we feel we're taking this project forward to the 21st century. And, uh, it will be connected with him in, in a way, but also hopefully inspiring people of the future, people who live in Bude and people who come to Bude. But just as the news of the Bude light broke, so did news of the rediscovery of another of Gurney's amazing inventions, a form of steam-powered tractor. His steam drag hauled the world's first commercial road passenger service 60 years before the motor car, and the remains of one have just been identified in a museum in Glasgow. In an old barn near Land's End, I discovered Rob Dyke, retired doctor, collector of early steam cars, and a man passionate about the possibility of restoring this incredible example of Cornish ingenuity. It's been lying on this floor, on the concrete floor, for 110 years. Well, there were three of these made, we think, by Gurney, and the, one of them was sent up to Scotland. We, we think it was just the one that went to Scotland, but this one appears to have been used before Gurney got to Scotland, and it was indeed blown up, so they say. There is av evidence of damage on the chassis, but we're not sure whether this is age-related and handling damage, or whether it's actually partly from an explosion. Now, of course, Gurney also ran what I believe was the world's first commercial passenger service forward by power, didn't he? Yes, that's right. This would have been identical to this vehicle. It was, a, it was an eight or nine mile journey each way, which was covered in about 50 minutes on average. And he could sometimes get that time down to about uh, 40 minutes. So he was going at a, a quite a good lick. And this was a faster average than you would expect from any horse-drawn vehicle at the time. Um, th this was fairly moving. Now, he kept this going. I think he did four trips a day, and he kept it going for eight or nine months, about 4,500 miles, I believe. So how significant is this, what we might call a rediscovery of this chassis? Um, well, we, we think it's very <laughs> significant. The oldest vehicle, steam vehicle in the world is undoubtedly Cuneo's. Um, this was probably not even designed to carry people at all, but to, carry, to pull guns, and it's 1770. Now, I have a friend who is a co-founder of the Brussels Museum, and they hired that for three months, and that hiring cost them £50,000. Uh, well, nearly in all, it cost nearly 100000 So that gives you some idea. These vehicles do have a, quite a value and they have a value to be on show. And this certainly would be the oldest vehicle that was practically running with passengers that, that is left in the world, as far as we can gather. Um, you know, unless there's another chassis lying somewhere else. But uh, th there were really no other... This was the first commercially run road vehicle anyway, as far as we know. So now I'll sing to you It's about a man
it's way down to La Morna that we're going next. That song by Cornwall's late great Brenda Wooden seemed like the ideal introduction to a tiny flower and potato farm perched on the cliffs a mile beyond La Morna Cove. We're going to a place called Minac, made famous by Derek Tangy and his wife Jeannie when they gave up a glamorous life in London to move to the derelict cottage where they made their life for nearly 50 years. Derek wrote a series of best-selling books about their life here, and the Minac Chronicles described in detail their experience of restoring ancient cliff meadows to grow Britain's earliest potatoes and flowers. But as they grew older, the farm became heavily overgrown and then derelict again after Derek's death. But now Minac has new tenants, Jane Bird and Peter Clough, and the remarkable thing is that Jane worked here over 40 years ago as a 14-year-old girl. And so, one bright spring morning, our daughter Faith joined me as we went down to Lamorna to cut a path through to the ancient meadows on the cliff. Here we are, off on our travels. This is a, the big expedition this morning, Jane. Yes, another, another foray into the Blackthorn to try and get a bit closer to the cliff edge. <laughs> We're setting off down towards the White Gate. We're just going alongside the, the little meadow, which hasn't got as many daffodils in this year as I've, I've seen in previous years. No, it's quite a light flowering year this year. I think it was such a cool, wet summer, things didn't set buds too well. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're sort of finding our way around the different crops. We've, we've, this is the QE2 field. We've picked everything in that one. Um, just a trial run, really, just to find out what's still acceptable on the market, um, whether it's worthwhile or not. Um, obviously, we don't want to do away with daffodils. We want to keep all we can, but we also have to have land that we can use for other things. So ones that aren't worthwhile on the market um, will get sort of, you know, put to be decorative in the hedge bottoms and so on, just to empty the fields. As happened before. I mean, that's what always happened here. They were that's thrown right. into the hedge banks. And, yeah. and that's one of the reasons it looks so fabulous here, isn't it? That's right. And it's a wonderful store of, of old varieties. I mean, some really historic varieties. Daffodils have been famous in their day. Um, there's a lot of interest in it now, you know, the sort of nostalgia thing that's going, everybody's looking for old timers. And uh, there's, some, there's one just here in front of us, Lawrence Costa, and that hasn't been marketed for donkey's years. Um, can you find Lawrence Costa? Here it's in clumps all down the lane. And the ones, of course, in the stable meadow are Oliver Cromwell. 
and uh, they've been here for probably nearly 100 years now and still holding their own. As you say, they're not flowering heavily this year, but they probably will next year. It's only, you know, they, everything takes a year off sometimes. That's a phenomenal thought, that something's been growing in the same field time after time, year after year, for the best part of 100 years. Because, mm. of course, when, when Derek and Jeannie came here, they were finding old varieties that were old-fashioned then, 50 years ago. That's right, and Oliver Cromwell was one of them. I remember when they took over this particular field, because that had belonged to one of the farms at Rose Modris. And uh, Oliver Cromwell, um, then we didn't market it because it was out of date. And here they are still going. <laughs> Great. <Yes. laughs> I think that's fabulous. Now, there's, there's your new puppy, Marmite, springing way ahead of us, twigs up here with us. But uh, Faith and Peter have disappeared. Now they're heading down towards what we're going to plan to do today, which is to try and cut a bit further down the cliff. That's right, yes. We, the, the real, what I call the true cliff meadows, the lower cliff, have been totally grown in for at least 20 years. And we were amazed just how solid it was with blackthorn. We have found the gateway and we found the little steps, but we had to literally cut each step through blackthorn. And we followed, we found the path part way. And we've just got a, la a last probably about 20 metres, and we think we will emerge on the more open bit of the cliff. So um, it'd be wonderful to make that breakthrough. We've made it, we're down the bottom, we've broken through the, the very last bit. You're going to describe this bit for us, Faith. You, you almost cut the last piece. Well, we're sitting on what looks like the edge of a cliff, but it's really got lots of rock spreading away down at the bottom of it. Um, the sea's sparkling in the sun underneath. Well, and the, the path here sort of follows the, the edge of this great chasm, doesn't it? The zorn down Yeah, you side. feel like you're going to fall off it all the time. Peter, these meadows are incredibly hard work now. The, the, yeah. These are the, the oldest of all of them, I aren't think they, they must be. Uh, uh, I don't think they're datable, these. They don't think anybody really has researched when these actually went on the cliff. And I suppose over hundreds of years, different people would have, you know, sort of do this sort of work right down in this wonderful site for growing things. I mean, just imagine these for potatoes. Right on the edge of the cliff, and it's all sloping, all room-sized. And they're all divided systems. off with huge, great outcrops yeah, of rock. I and mean, then they basically just filled in with little rocks in The place. miracles of building, it's, it, it reminds me of the sort of epics you see in China on a huge scale, and this is like the Cornish... The Cornish gain of land. Brilliant. From the cliffs of Lamorna on the south coast, we're going up to a tin shack high above the cliffs of Tintagel on the north coast of Cornwall. I've come up here on a cold, wet day to meet an old slate worker on the eve of his retirement. Les Avery's spent a lifetime splitting slates, first at Delabole and now at Trevillet, where he's passing on his skills to two youngsters. There's one pretty good family here, you know. They got some good boys bringing on here as well. Because they, you know, you've got at uh, this time of the life, you've got um, our job to get some youngsters interested in it, really. But we got two or three good boys here. Yes, and we got two eight on the tips, picking out war stones, so on, do everything. Aim another two good boys, you know. So I'm I'm really lucky. I'm I'm glad now they're looking to the future of the um, slate industry, really, because it's gone down a bit, really. But uh, at present year, we've never been so busy, really. Yeah, you're sitting here splitting roofing slate out. What is the art of splitting out a good slate? You've been doing it for 50-odd years, yeah. so <laughs> you, if anybody can tell me, it's you. What, what makes a good slate? Well, you look at your block, really, or your piece of stone, what you get, and you, you think in your head, well, what will it make? And you say, well, that isn't quite so good. You'll go for random, which is thicker than the slate. And if you've got a good piece of stone, you'll go for the slate size, which is 20 by 10s down to 12 by 6s, which is rat and but randoms is 20 by any size, really, you know. It can be 20 by 15 down to 20 by 10. I mean, um, you've got to understand that when you're doing a 20-inch random, you got to be 10 inches wide or over. 
It's got to be half the length, really, or over. So that's uh, the, um, but the most um, important thing is to know your stone, and and the quartering of it got to be pretty good, really, you know. And in spite of all the factories and around this area growing up, and in spite of all the machinery here in this quarry, you're still sitting doing a job just as it's been done for hundreds of years. On a nice day you move outside, on a rotten day you move in under a bit of shelter. That's but we're right. sitting here now looking out over the bay. Yes, that's right. Um, we, uh, we go outside, do a bit of spitting when it's nice weather. It can be lovely then, looking out to Tintagel Castle Way. And uh, when, like you said, but when there's rough weather, they're in no order job or terrible job in winter when uh, frost is on the ground. And if the frost get in the stone, you've got to eave all the stone away because uh, it's in a bit of good. The frost is the worst thing to get in a piece of stone or a piece of block. And you've just got to dump, dump it all. It's no good for even for paving. There's, the frost just spoil it completely. In Pennsylvania, USA, the quarries of the slate belt are very different to our fairly shallow pits here, and I discussed this with Fred Doney, former owner of the Diamond and the New Doney. We were, uh, two of our quarries were well over 700. That was no problem. Sounds terrifying. No, 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 no. My wife used to go up and down too, and she didn't think anything of it. She used to say it's where the elevators are worse than that. It's no problem. How did you get up and down them? Oh, you had double drum hoisting engines, steam engines, and you had an overhead cable weight, and now we have our steel ropes, uh, which were always, the smallest one I know of was two inches in diameter, and ours were, they ran from two to two and a half inches in diameter. They ran from a dead man, concrete dead man, or originally it was a wooden dead man, on one edge of the pit, came across the pit over the top of a 50 or 75 foot derrick, and to another dead man behind the engine house. Now that gave us a cableway and a carriage was ran back and forth over the on this cableway. The front drum of the engine controlled the location of the carriage. The back drum uh, controlled the billy wheel, the hoisting hook. The Slate Belt's playing host to the 10th gathering of Cornish Cousins in three months' time. Centred on Penargel and Bangor, the pace of fundraising and organisations hotting up, and co-chair Carolyn Bray told me more. We're not trying to outdo what has been done in the past, but being the 10th, it should be something memorable, I think. And um, this is something our area, I guess you would call, kind of has a track record on that. When we do something, we do do it special. We did this in 1982 uh, when we had the town centennial. And it was a very special affair and lasted a week. And uh, we raised a lot of money for that. So we've been there, done that type of thing. And now this is our special thing that the town is going to support us and put on. So yes, it is probably more money than has ever been raised for one of these gatherings. But we think this is a real special affair. And in our next edition, as we prepare for the 10th gathering, we'll be visiting Delabow, still seen as the heart of the Cornish slate industry, to hear how a hole in the ground has dominated the lives of villagers like Doris Chapman. Well, there's always been a quarry in my life, and there, because I was obviously I was born quite near. And um, it does dominate the village. There's not so much now, because there's not so many men that work there. But everywhere in Delabow, except one scar in Delabow, was built with Delabow stone and Delabow slate. And Delabow stone built houses um, never fall down, not like these new things that are just built with concrete. But um, yeah, the slate is everywhere. My house is stone built. And I've got about two foot thick walls in my house, which is an old cottage built purposely many years ago in the last century for the Delabow working men. The world of Celtic music is an exciting one at the moment. We hope to bring you more of this as musicians here in Cornwall experiment with the sounds of their heritage.
but this song in Cornish comes from South Australia. It's about Trothevi Quoit, a remarkable Neolithic burial tomb near Land's End, and it's from a collection of tunes by Gavin O'Loughlin and Cotter's Bequest, in which the musicians explore the heritage of all their motherlands. Oh, 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 oh,
Cornwall has been selected by the European Union to receive up to £300 million. That's around $500 million of grant funding. It's not all good news. We were only given the funds because we're officially rated as one of the poorest nations of Europe and we'll still have to find match funding ourselves. But farmers' leader Richard Jenkin is delighted. I think that we were all looking forward to this. This is a real boost to Cornish industry and in particular to Cornish agriculture. Uh, a lot of our produce within the county goes out of the county and up uh, country to different markets and there are opportunities now to improve the road structure, um, to build um, centralised bases where we can go forward and uh, it's excellent, it's good news. Let the walk of the common people from Cornwall to London commence. <laughs> Two years ago, Cornwall hit the national headlines with a march commemorating the 1497 uprising. A series of political demands were put forward when the marchers reached Blackheath in London, and most people here considered that those demands were ignored. But Cornish marchers aren't easily dispirited, and so they're going to try again this summer. Sue Bowen explains the significance of the prayer book rebellion to be commemorated by the march. It's celebrates the beginning of the end for the Cornish language in that the prayer book was forcibly changed from the Latin which everybody uh, understood and was able to qu quote parrot fashion even if they didn't even know it uh, to insistence upon the prayer book being in English Anglo-Saxon Protestant English and this was beginning of the end within 200 years of that move the Cornish language was dead And so we turn from the present to the past, and yet another cliff-top setting where I've been down to the historic Levant Mine near Land's End. Back around 60 years ago, a couple of enthusiasts managed to save the historic steam whim or winding engine at the mine. It was about to be scrapped, and their interventions meant that it's now the only surviving whim engine which can still be steamed. The engine house perches precariously on the edge of the cliffs near St Just and the whim hauled ore from the workings stretching out miles under the sea. Nowadays it's kept in steam by a dedicated group of volunteers working with the Trevithick Trust and during the winter they've been replacing a dangerously cracked pump rod with a new design. I joined Norman Lackford and Duncan Nicholson as they prepared for the tense moment of its first test under steam. Duncan, I've just walked in here. This is the, the first steaming this it's year, first isn't it? This year. Tell me where we're at at the moment. We're gradually warming through the engine. We've got the throttle valve just cracked open. We've got about one pound pressure on the engine side of the throttle valve, and we're letting it warm through very, very slowly. This then, is important, this very slow warming, oh yes, is it? Yes, it is. And then in the middle, we'll reverse it. So that's usually a double acting engine. So we are just warming through one side at the moment. When this side is fairly warm, we'll reverse it, put the reversing lever across and warm the other side of the right. engine. And when she's nice and hot right through, then we'll pray to the good Lord and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually quite a small beam as Cornish engines go, mm, isn't it? It's quite a, tid it's a tiddler, yeah. <laughs> it's about two, two and a half tons, perhaps. Mm. Um, Pump an engine beam would be 50 odd tons. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a pretty little engine, this, oh, isn't it? It's a sweet little thing. You've had a real problem here. And it's one that goes back about 100 years, haven't you, Norman? Yes. When the engine was originally installed in 1840, it was a 24 inch. In 1860, as the mine went deeper and they wanted more power, it was enlarged to 27 inch. For ease of installation, the new cylinder was installed using two of the original bed bolts. That meant that the cylinder was offset. It was, of course, easy to move the beam over, so they moved the beam over, but left the condenser where it was. So to overcome that misalignment, they put this S-bend in the pump rod, but we decided to crack test the rod. Having crack tested the rod, we found some very, very serious flaws in the rod, and it was considered unsafe to continue using it, so we made a new pump rod. Using modern methods, of course, and modern materials, the pump rod that was made, is a straight rod. 
I mean, we understand, of course, the purists will come along and tell us that the rods were made of raw time and they would be full of longitudinal cracks, and we expected to find those. What we didn't expect to find were the major horizontal cracks that occurred throughout the rod. At some parts of the rod were in serious danger of letting go. And, of course, if the rod broke, we could have a very, very serious accident in the engine house. And with the public in here, we felt that the risks were such that we could not justify continuing to use it. Of course, accidents with engines like this were fairly common when they were actually in use and, and working under tremendous strain. And we were saying earlier that some of yes. the, the big bobs were actually about 50 tonnes. When one of those broke, it, it was absolute oh, yes. catastrophe. That, that, that's right. And of course, the, that was in the days that this was an industrial site. And in the 1800s, we didn't have any of the safety legislation that we had now. Boiler accidents and, and steam loss were a very common occurrence. The, contrary to popular belief, although there's a lot of very, very historic and romantic images attached to Cornish mining, it never was a safe practice, even for an engine driver. Boiler explosions were a very common occurrence. Accidents with beams breaking, accidents while lubricating the engines was a, almost a daily occurrence. Yes, because of course they wouldn't stop the engine so they could get in and do the daily greasing. No, and these right. old engines needed constant care and attention. You're always putting, filling up oil that's baths, right. filling up grease into the bearings and so on, aren't you, on an engine like this? That's right. This is very sanitised now, of course, because of the public access. We have grills around everything for safety. But as at the moment, as you see, because we're carrying out our initial steaming, we have no grills here. And of course, this is how the engines would operate. So all these moving parts were exposed, particularly in an engine house like this, where effectively you stand inside the engine to operate. Right, sir. The moment arrived. We're in the way here. Yeah? The moment's arrived, has it, Duncan? <laughs> right, tell me if I'm in the way. Are you going to go with it? No. I'll stand like that to pieces. <laughs> the condenser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's steam in. Try the other direction, there we go. There we go. There's a lot of water in the condenser to expel first. So what you've got here is, is water pressure, which of course can't be compressed, stopping the engine that's, working. That's right. The condenser, of course, because of the, all the priming and the warming up time, has taken so much water that we now have a hydraulic lock. And of course, being a vacuum engine, it's possible now that that water level has risen to the bottom of the cylinder. So what we're doing now is running it over on the winch a couple of times to attempt to expel most of that water first. Can we keep going? Can we go over another complete revolution first? All clear? There we go. And away it goes. Yes. You have to remember, of course, that this has new packing on all the glands, new packing on the valve. So everything is mechanically very, very tight. So it's going to take some time effectively to run in and free everything off. So it's not surprising that that happened. We expected that to happen. In fact, we see that from the two gauges that it's in vacuum. And in fact, it was in vacuum above the piston whilst we had the hydraulic lock below. Yes. So it wasn't entirely unexpected, but now it's away and it's free. And it's operating extremely it's operating beautifully. Well. It's just about silent. Yes. <laughs> There's nothing I can hear. Very, of it. very undramatic. Just hear the small wisp of steam going into the engine and the water that's being expelled from the condenser. Yeah. Yeah. 
You're pleased with that? Yes, very pleased. It's, it's running really smoothly. We, on the old pump rod, we had major vibration on every stroke of the engine, particularly on the downstroke. There was a major vibration and a major thump. As you can see, the pump rod is running smoothly, silently, and there is very little vibration on that at all now. Of course, the engine stopped operating in 1930. Its preservation is a complete fluke, isn't it? Because what the <laughs> it was saved from the scrap man, but only because the engine that they wanted to save had already been scrapped. They went off to get some money, came back, and they, the scrappers yes. had already smashed up the one they yes, wanted they to buy. Yes, they tried to save the pumping engine originally. As it happens, the the best engine has probably been saved because it's a winding engine and it's unique. But it's like everything else at Levant. Everything at Levant has been by chance and good fortune over the years. It's been a, a long running mine with major disasters, major problems, and historically it's overcome all those obstacles over the years. And once again, the engine lives and we hope we'll continue to live for a further two to three hundred years. <laughs>